God designed us to be in relationships. There are so many ways in which we disciple in the context of our local church. Mm -hmm. This is one way. What's so beautiful about our marriages is that they can be the most significant setting for, for soul healing. Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. We're so glad that you're here with us this week. We are going to be having a conversation about marriage, uh, specifically what it looks like to have a biblical marriage and how to counsel biblically through issues that arise in uh, a marriage context, marriage setting. And obviously we know that marriages can be really difficult, that relationships can be really difficult. And so uh, today we're going to be discussing what it looks like to use the word of God and to seek biblical counsel uh, when there are issues in marriage. And uh, we're going to be discussing this stuff with my dear friend, Jonathan Kindler, who is professor of biblical counseling here at LFBI, but also a practitioner, a professional counselor here in the Kansas City area. And so it's always a good time having him here. And with that, I want to welcome you to the show, man. Thank you. Good to have you. It's good to be here. You were on another podcast. You're like making your way around other podcasts now. Yeah, that's what I'm, it's a part-time job. <laughs> Did you, do you enjoy it? No, no, I don't. I, I, if it's uncomfortable knowing there's like other people, you know, listening in on a conversation, I guess, but it's fun to talk about things that I'm passionate about. So on yeah. that, in that front, it's cool. Yeah. So before we get too far into our conversation today, because we do have a lot to talk about. And I want to make sure that we, we leave enough space and enough time and energy for, for all the many different things that, that can come up in, in relation to this mm -hmm. idea or this, this um, issue. But before we do, I want to mention some statistics to kind of frame the conversation. I like to do that, especially when we talk, because I think it gives people sure. a, a, something to work from in their mind before we get into it. According to a Barna report, um, four out of every five adults, that's 78%, have been married at least once. Even higher proportions of born-again Christians, 84% get married. Okay, so lots of Christians get married. 84% mm -hmm. of Christians get married at least once. Among adults who have been married, the study discovered that one-third, 33%, have experienced at least one divorce, which is a lot. Yeah. Right? Does that surprise you? Does that shock you at all when you hear that statistic? Does that, you know... Not from what I've experienced working with people as you're, as you're talking about, I was just thinking about how, um, you know, like when we get married, we don't think about this coming to an end, like a relationship coming mm -hmm. to the end. And, um, it really parallels what happens in our, in our life, like in our, you know, when we're moving through life and we kind of pick up ways of managing our life. And over time, sin kind of builds up. It talks about it in James, like how, when sin is fully grown, then um, it, le it leads to death, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think about that for marriages as well. We have, you know, these people who are committing their lives to one another and then, you know, um, not really fully aware of how maybe they're doing things in the relationship that over time leads to death and just little subtle things that maybe we, you know, don't really think much about like divisiveness in our relationship or distance that we allow to creep in. Mm -hmm. It actually leads to divorce. So, right. Yeah. You become over time, you become desensitized yeah. to the problems in a relationship. You, yeah. when you get married, you think everything's perfect. Right. And you only have high expectations and, and, and you're full of anticipation, but then little things creep in and you get used to it. You're like, Oh, well he just talks that way or yes. she just acts that way. And it's frustrating to me, but I'm just going to ignore it, put my head down and move on. You normalize all of that that behavior until it, you know, it creeps in in a way it's, it's toxic in a way it like mm -hmm. it goes septic. It, it reminds me if you're like driving through Kansas, you know, and uh, you pull over into a town that maybe has like feedlots and stuff. Oh yeah. These people don't know that their whole life is spent around a smell of cow <laughs> feces. You yeah. know, when you open your car door, it just, you get hit with the yeah, smell. For people outside of town, yes. they come through the town. Yes. It's, it's vulgar. Yes. It's disgusting. Yes. But people that live there have no idea that their town stinks. Right. And, and that's the same thing when couples come into, you know, the counseling office, you get to start to really see what's happening in the relationship and it hits you 
Um, and it's just normal to them. They talk to each other in a way, they treat each other in a way that's just um, not loving, you know, and, and that just becomes the state of their relationship. And over time that takes a toll. So, you know, those stats aren't, unfortunately aren't surprising. Um, and a lot of times at the point that someone gets to the counseling setting, right. It, they've had years and years of this compounding. Mm -hmm. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. By the time it gets to you, it's, it's a, it's at a shocking state. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times people don't, um, come until it's what seems to be too late. And, you know, as, as believers, we have hope, you know, mm -hmm. an assured hope that God can completely, uh, regenerate, can transform that relationship in a way that, um, uh, is real and, and can move them in a different direction in their life. But, it can feel really daunting in those moments to know how to manage those situations. So, so in your private practice, mm -hmm. do you meet with lots of, of couples? I mean, is that a common thing? Yeah, I do. I, I meet with, you know, um, individuals and families and couples. And I would say, you know, it kind of fluctuates based on the, the season, but over the course of the decade that I've been doing it, um, you know, I would say maybe half of the people that I work mm -hmm. with are couples and, even more than that, I would say most of the people that I work with, the reason why they're coming in is related to, to some sort of relational distress that's happened at some point. So maybe they're coming in with, you know, some anxiety or depression or adjustment in their life, or maybe they have some addiction. But when we start unpacking it, it quickly moves to some problems they've had in relationships. And mm -hmm. I think this is because God designed us to be in relationships. He created us to, uh, for our needs that he created us with to be met through him and through the relationships he places in our life. And so when those relationships don't go well, we often right. start reaching for other ways of coping with our life that ends up causing a lot of pain. So if it isn't that I'm working with couples or families, it, um, a lot of times I'm still it's working all, it's with- It's all relationship stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. So- when we're talking about th these couples though, that are coming specifically to you, you know, what are some of the things that they're bringing up? What are some of the conversations that you're having? What are the, some of the trends that you're noticing when you, when you meet with these folks? So whether I'm working, you know, with individuals or families uh, or couples, you know, those presenting issues typically have some sort of relational impact. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I get to see people who are uh, believers and non-believers and work with them, you know, with their, their relationships. Right. Yeah. And we've talked about this before that, that kind of on the intake, when people come into your office, they let you know whether or not they're Christians mm -hmm. and whether or not they want some form of biblical counseling um, when they meet with you. If they say, no, it's an opportunity to evangelize, I guess, you know, but, but, and, and introduce them to Christ right. as an answer. But when people say, Hey, I am a believer, I am a Christian it invites biblical dialogue right from the very beginning. Yeah. Right. And which is really helpful. So the difference between working with, you know, a couple that's, you know, knows the Lord and then, you know, non-believers from the, from the onset, it, they actually look fairly similar because they're both in distress, you mm -hmm. know, and um, you know, they both have similar cycles that are playing out in the relationship. I would say the key difference between, you know, these, the two different relationships is that uh, the fact that believers have a final authority, um, at least they profess that they do. Right. And so you have, whether they understand what that means or not, they're right. saying that they have one. Right. And so you can bring them to it and mm -hmm. show them what it says about their life and having the word of God as this foundation. And, you know, just like any other foundation, if, if the foundation is unsettled, um, you know, or if it's uneven, when there's pressure placed on that, it starts to crack. And so I think that's something I see a lot when I'm working with, uh, whether it be a couple who one individual is a believer and one isn't, or if they're mm -hmm. both lost, um, that it, they're more prone to that fragility. And that's, that's a, a major difference between, you know, this kind of biblical counseling and maybe other approaches that you might get out in the world. And so this leads us into the key difference between couples who profess faith and those who don't, you know, they don't have this foundational biblical truth. And so when you don't have that, when that foundation is not, you know, not, not even, then it presents the potential of when pressure happens on the relationship, mm -hmm. that it's going to cause that fracturing in the mm -hmm. relationship. So non-Christians couples don't have that foundation making their relationship more fragile. And then it just becomes this negotiation. You know, it's like, are we still going to agree to be in this relationship? Whereas 
Christian couples have mm. something more foundational that they can find their footing in. So that's interesting. So do you sense that there is a pressure in Christian relationships to stay together where with the lost, the lost people in the counseling setting are like, yeah, this is, we're at the end here. This is so our last ditch. Yeah, a lot of times just on the table. So there's greater pressure on the Christian and they even know that. You Can you sense that they feel that, that there's a higher, you know? Yeah, they, they see the commitment more often than not. They, say, they see the commitment that they've made to be more of something like an oath that they, you know, they want to mm-hmm. live their life to. And so they, it creates like a, a huge incongruence in them because everything that they've been living out, you know, that's led up to this, this moment of fracture is incongruent with this thing that they say they believe in. Which, right. So with the Christians, I would assume that the problems that are presented in the relationship probably feel more monumental than like their things feel much more dire, um, much more desperate because they have these truths and these vows that yeah. they know that they're supposed yeah. to be holding to. Yeah. And I think, um, we'll probably get into this later, but it's because, um, you know, there's the realization that our relationship uh, means a lot more than just this commitment that we made to each other, but mm-hmm. it's a picture and right. we'll probably talk about that yeah. as we go along. Yeah. How does biblical counseling for marriage differ from other approaches? You know, just the, the, the philosophical approach of biblical counseling, how is that distinguish itself from other approaches that you see other people using or other Mm -hmm. approaches maybe that even you use when you're dealing with the lost? What separates biblical counseling and makes it uniquely effective over any other counseling, marital counseling modality is uh, that it's, it has a goal that um, is not about behavioral change, but it's Mm -hmm. about uh, transformational heart change. And so a lot of Uh, Secular theories are about, you know, uh, addressing the solution, creating a solution to address behavior. Mm -hmm. And even some of the uh, theoretical frameworks that are more so addressing like a a deeper root issue, they run into the the objective truth problem. You know, Mm -hmm. so when they're working with someone, everything is so objective that it can become really fragile, as we were talking about earlier. So uh, this can even play out in Bible believing counseling as well. You know, a lot of times. Um, we, when we just open God's word and we take a passage and we try to implement it in someone's life, we can also, um, you know, fall into the trap addressing of just behaviors, just addressing behaviors. A good, mm. a good example of this is the key verse that we go to in marriage counseling is Ephesians 5, 21 through the end of the chapter where we, we have the roles of the wife and the husband. And this is an important foundational passage, but, um, if we just implement that passage and we don't. Uh, identify the context that Paul lays out Ephesians one through four, right? Then we miss the heart posture yeah. that we need to have in order for Ephesians five twenty one to actually work. Man, so I, I really like that. So what you're saying is that a lot of times we fall prey to the same stuff the secular guys are doing we by addressing the mm-hmm. symptoms, addressing the behaviors, addressing what's presented clearly, like a. Uh, you're not being kind to one another and you fight a lot and you're supposed to be submitting. Right. And so you ought to submit. Right. Versus working backwards and thinking about things in terms of sanctification. All right. So you mentioned this idea of, of the character and principles associated with the first part of Ephesians being critical to actually understanding the roles of a marriage relationship. Mm-hmm. So before you can get into that, like why, why take that out of context? Why strip that out and prescribe right. it when we ought to be looking at the whole of the text to inform right. how to get to Ephesians chapter five. Can you show us how to do that? Like, what do you mean by that? And then use that as a way of explaining to us how biblical counseling ought to work if it's, if it's functioning right. Right. So, uh, you know, any type of biblical counseling needs to start with the gospel. You know, Mm -hmm. there needs to be that heart transformation. And so um, when we look through Ephesians, we start in Ephesians, it begins with God's glory. So Paul talks about in Ephesians 1, everything in our life is to bring God's God glory. And that includes our marriages. So there's kind of this false narrative that we have going into our marriages where we um, we have this. perception that it's all about us. Yeah. Right. And the in goal fact, is a good marriage. Right. That's the goal is ha- being happy in our marriage. That's good the goal. Christian marriage, even, you know? Right. And, yeah. And uh, in reality, um, 
our marriage is about him, you mm-hmm. know, and for him to receive glory. And so in Ephesians 2, it talks about, um, it starts with our humble repentance, right? Because oftentimes we're moving into relationships with this self-focus. Uh, our, our marriage needs to be better. It needs to be about us and fixing our relationship. When in reality, um, the narrative needs to be about surrender, mm-hmm. right? We need to be surrendering our life, which then is in eventually going to lead to the behaviors of our marriage yeah. being better. Yeah. So, so far we've got God's glory, which mm-hmm. focuses on our greater, greater purpose, like purposes as in terms of mankind mm-hmm. and our life and our soul and our eternity, the, the biggest and grandest ideas starting there rather than with this actually fairly minuscule thing, our marriage, this relationship right. between two people get big, see how big God is and how we fit mm-hmm. in his plan. But then the next thing is, is our character right before God? Like, are we holding on to sins? Mm-hmm. Is there something in particular that's incongruent about me as an individual that needs to be made right before the Lord? What do I need to yield before right. I take the next step? Right. It's about God's grace and, and moving into putting off the old man and, and putting on the new man. Mm-hmm. Yeah which then leads us into the the last part, which is growing uh, growth in grace. So we need Christ's power and having the power of the Holy Spirit in order for us to live a life walking in the Spirit and to get the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And this is true for our relationships as well. Acts 1.8 says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So, I mean, in order for anything to happen in our, in our relationships that is pleasing to the Lord, it has to be through his power. Yeah. So we start with acknowledging uh, that God, you know, God's glory, and that's the, the purpose of our relationships. And then we, we move through uh, the guilt you know, of recognizing that, man, I need to surrender my life, which then leads to receiving grace for salvation, but then also sanctification. And that allows us to grow and to have the power we need to do anything that we might need to do in the counseling setting, but also Mm -hmm. in our lives and our relationships and whatever we're doing. And so, I mean, all of that becomes critical because it's the groundwork for whether or not any relationship is going to work, let alone our our marriage relationship. And so, man, if you don't recognize a need for worship and to glorify God and Mm -hmm. your life has a greater purpose and that... Um, we need to deal with sin before a holy and righteous God and that we are wrong yeah. so much of the time that we, we aren't as justified as we think we are in our behavior and, and our actions, man, we got to get that right. But then living out the grace that he's bestowed upon us. Hey, I've forgiven you. It's, right. it's going to be okay. There is hope. Let me walk with you. Mm-hmm. And at the point that you're walking in the spirit and you're walking with Christ, man, all these new character qualities are beginning to come out and you're beginning yeah. to see patience and temperance and goodness and peace and all these things that you didn't know you had available to you become right. available. Now, hey, here's the role and the responsibility yes. of a husband or a wife to yes. one another in a marriage relationship. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. really good. So w- with all that in mind, now we are at marriage. What does a biblical marriage look like? What is the purpose of marriage and, and how can we begin to address those types of things? Yeah, so um, I want to quote uh, you. And uh, a book that we're getting to write together uh, for the intro class. So we're writing oh, yeah. that um, a book just to say uh, for the You're intro. You're announcing the book yes, right now. Yes, right now. Uh, for the intro to biblical counseling class, uh, this is just giving a theology for biblical counseling. But I thought you did, the way that you described what you just asked me, I think is, is really powerful. You said the sacred institution of marriage forms the greatest relationship two people can share on the earth. It is from the union, it's from this union that God forms a new ministry, new vision, new sacrifice, and new life. Mm-hmm. So ultimately the purpose for every marriage is glorifying God. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, marriage is to be this picture of, of the relationship between Christ and the church. And so what Christ did for the church. And so, uh, you know, when we see a wife lovingly honoring her husband, um, as you know, the, the church does to Christ. And we see the husband laying down his life sacrificially for his bride, like Christ has done for the church. This is one of the most significant ways that we can minister uh, to, to the lost world, to our, to our neighbors, to our family, our friends. When they see our relationship uh, working in a way that's foreign to them, it, mm-hmm. it shakes them. You know, the, the truth is, the lost world doesn't understand 
this kind of love. No, there's no context for it. And so, you know, they may say, uh, till death do you part, um, until, you know, like you're not meeting my needs or your body yeah, right. yeah. doesn't look the way it did when I married you. There's, there's all there's of exceptions, these exceptions, right. Yeah. It's, and so there's this transactional relationship that plays out in, in marriages in the world, um, that looks a lot different than, uh, yeah. And it's interesting because it, you got me thinking too, when a lo- a lost couple, uh, sees a Christian couple, how often is it that they see something unique, right? Like when they're looking at other Christian couples, married couples, mm-hmm. what is it that they're seeing? I mean, are, do the relationships just look the same? Well, that's just like our relationship. We, they bicker, we bicker. Mm-hmm. They, they're not getting along. Um, you know, the wife is bossing the husband around the husband, you know, it looks like a, a sorry sap out there in the yard mm-hmm. working, trying to get away from his, you know, right. nagging wife. Any and, sitcom, plug any right, sitcom. Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where the, yeah. the husband is an idiot and the wife has all the answers and, you know, and that these dynamics are happening in the lost world all the time. Are, is that what they're seeing in Christian relationships or are they seeing a dynamic that right. looks like reverence and submission and sacrifice and submission? Like, right. And when they see that, it, it it's like a shining light, right? Like right. when they see it, it working the way that it, it's supposed to biblically, it's this, it just illuminates the personage yeah. of Jesus Christ in a way that that nothing else can. Right. Yeah, exactly. And it, I mean, it's such a um, powerful way for uh, you know us to practically minister to the lost world because it is that picture. Mm-hmm. Another um um, purpose for the marriage, for our marriage is to be, uh, transformed into the image of Christ. So marriage, uh, you know, this, this is one of God's principal tools for sanctification, um, breaking us out of our self sufficiencies and our self focus. I, you know, I didn't realize, you know, how selfish of a person I was until I got married. Yeah. And then I didn't realize how exceedingly selfish I was until I became a, a dad. You know, it's like mm-hmm. these uh, these biblically, you know, God ordained structures have are are there to uh, refine us yeah. into the image of Christ. Right. And, and you can either get more entrenched into your sinfulness. That's the crazy thing is that you have this option. Whenever the refining fire comes, uh, either it does its perfect work mm-hmm. or it breaks the mold. Right. Like. You could just say to yourself, you know what? Um, I like my selfish life. Yeah. And this is actually getting in the way. And so I'm going to continue to subvert this relationship mm-hmm. so that I can continue to get what I want. So I can continue to get this to work the way I want it to work. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't work, right, I'm going to throw a fit. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to leave. I'm going to walk out. And that's like, you know. Yeah. I, I, what you're saying is me, it's causing me to think of like, so when you think about what our marriages can actually be, they can be, uh, you know, the most comforting haven or it can be, you know, hell on earth. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, I think, uh, you know, a lot of times that's where I see people is, is this hell on earth. But what's so beautiful about our marriages is that they can be the, the most significant setting for, for soul healing, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of time. And this is one of I, I love this part of marriage. You know, when I, I get excited when I'm working with couples, when they kind of start turning the corner, because this is, this is so incredible how God allows us to be in a relationship that has such a, a beautiful way of, of being the hands and feet of Jesus to one another. It's, um, you know, when we, we often show up in our marriages uh, from a lifetime of uh, relational pain, you know, whether yeah. uh, we've been hurt in past relationships Um, where it teaches us lies, you know, about ourselves, about other people. We have distorted perspectives of who God is. And I get to be my wife's uh, most significant um, biblical counselor. I get to Mm -hmm. speak into her life in a way because of how intimate our relationship is mentally. Not because you're a therapist, but because (laughs) you're her husband, right? Right, right. Yeah, right. Like, so, and she gets to be that for me as well. Mm -hmm. Like, because we uh, have this intimacy mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, uh, we can speak into each other's lives like no one else can. If, if you're invited to do, to do so, like if you've earned that, which is the thing I think part of what we're talking about is if we have the right purpose and the right love and the right attitude towards yes. one another and we're willing to die and we're willing to let things go and, and we're willing to, we don't even need to compromise. We can, yes. lo- we can, if it means losing to win our spouse's heart, we yes. do that. 
because it invites the kind of relationship that you're talking mm-hmm. about where two people um, love each other in such a way they know all each other's dirt, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You, you know, all your idiosyncrasies and all the ways in which you, you fail or are weak. And right. yet you can love each other through that. Right. How, how better way is there to heal from all the relational wounds of the past than Absolutely. to have a relationship that's unconditional? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you have um, God created a marriage to, to be glorifying to him and then also you know, implements it in our lives to, to be this transforming thing mm-hmm. that sanctifies us. It's like, it's so cool how he knitted that together. Yeah. I love that. So we've talked a lot so far just about, you know, the right approach to a marriage, what a biblical marriage looks like, um, how you might go about addressing in a really broad sense issues within a marriage. Mm-hmm. But I, I do want to ask you, what are some of the, the issues that you see come into the counseling setting? So when they show up to you, what is some of the baggage that they are carrying? Mm-hmm. And at, you know, at what point do they recognize, oh man, I, now I need counseling. Right. Like this, I mean, they've probably been fighting or at each other's throat or things have been broken mm-hmm. for a long time. At what point does a couple say to themselves, okay, it's gotten so bad yeah. that we, we need to turn to a counselor and get some serious help? Yeah, I think, uh, well, there's, there's probably three different... Um, moments in a relationship where I see the most often, you know, okay. people coming in to, to, to get counseling. The first would be premarital counseling, which is, uh, you know, awesome. People coming in before they, you know, they're kind of counting. Okay. Here's an interesting question though, for you, before you get into this, do, yeah. do lost people do premarital counseling? You is know, that a thing? I don't, it, I, I never it, knew that as a phenomenon. It's not, not typically, not historically, but it's actually becoming something that I'm seeing more and more, which is really interesting. And it's a, it's a really neat way to, to share the gospel because I can, I can ask them questions about, you know, where, you know, where did, the union of marriage begin. And so mm-hmm. I can take them, you know, to Genesis and just talk through it, even just from a principal perspective, which then, you know, starts to get the foot in the door about talking about, you know, what it pictures and how and, why, that be. and why do it. Right. Right. You get yeah. to ask the really, Abs- really big questions like, okay, Absolutely. so why do you want to get married? What yes. is this all about? And then it puts them in a position where they have to discover that there, there has to be a, a bigger right. reason, a bigger purpose. I've actually used, um, sorry right here, actually, I've used this starting right. Okay. Um, which is our uh, Living Faith Books published um, premarital material. It's awesome. You know, it, it goes through looking at the, the table the, of contents, table of contents. So we got the purpose of marriage, roles of marriage, family finances, conflict, intimacy, and then steps moving forward. This is such a simple and yet it's packed with uh, just a, everything that you'd need to take right. someone through marital counseling. So if someone was uh, a pastor or a counselor was leading someone or even just a couple, mm-hmm. uh, this is such a cool resource, but I've, I've led uh, lost couples through this uh, and it's been really powerful wow. just for them to, to like, yeah, get a, a more real understanding of what mer- what they're actually doing. So that's good. That's I'm, pretty cool. I'm, it's cool that you're using that with lost people. Yes. It's very cool. I asked them, it, you know, uh, it, you'd be surprised like how open people are to, yeah, whatever, man. I don't know. What, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, do you want to know what the Bible says about marriage? Because I think it's a, a lot of times people have a pastor you know, officiate their wedding, yeah. even if they're lost. So it's kind of already like, there's a, yeah, this sure. is going to be a spiritual moment. The right. wedding is going to be spiritual. There's, there's ceremonial things, ritual things happening. Sure. It feels really big. Yeah. Why not get a Bible out? Tell yeah. me, tell me what the Bible Let's has to say. <laughs> yeah. It's That's a, interesting. Yeah. It's a cool, um, and I think you've had experiences like that too, where there's, you've got to take people through this and really see where they're at with the Lord and mm-hmm. see lives change, lives change that way too. And it's also kind of interesting to me that, that Christians don't have premarital counseling in their churches. And so they're coming to you because they don't have that resource right. in the context of their own local church. They're coming to a counselor outside of that in sure. order to seek counseling, which is also what an interesting I, idea. What I see a lot is uh, uh, Christians who don't have a church. You know, it's like mm. kids who grew up a lot of times when you start a family, it's like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I should probably do Christian stuff, you know? And right. so, you know, they've been, they've in, been on hi- hiatus. Yeah. For they're, the last, de- they're deconstructing. Yeah. They're busy deconstructing, which sure. means they're really just going to the 
sporting events and sure. spending their time doing other things. Other a lot things. Of and yeah. so that when they start making big life decisions, you see people do that when they get married or when they have a lot of people, when they have kids, they're like, Hey, tell me about, you know, like, what do you do with your kids? And you go to church. Some mm -hmm. people are more interested because they're starting to think about like, yeah, where their sparks, life is headed. Spark something new. Absolutely. So that's one of the settings. Right? One, of, one of the situations is people come in for premarital. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next time I see people, you know, a lot of times is like seven years in, which is kind of a weird thing, but it's this You always phenomenon. hear that, seven years. It's weird. It's, That's a real thing. I, I don't know how many times I've heard a couple say, yeah, we've been married for seven years. It, it seems like it's the, just the right amount of time before, you know, a couple that didn't really know what they were doing or getting themselves into self-destruct. Mm. You know, it's like they can hold their breath for seven years and then they're done, you know? And so... I see, you know, couples come in and they've just completely destroyed each other. I also well, wonder if they think to themselves, I'm still young enough where if I want to do this again, I can. If I end this relationship hmm. now, I've got one more crack at it before I'm old. That might be it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's when you're working with people who don't care about the sanctity of marriage. That's mm -hmm. definitely on the table. Interesting. I mean, a lot of times people come in, that that's one of the first things they say. It's almost like they want you to want you to convince them that they should stay married in a way, which is mm -hmm. a whole other or conversation. Or justify, either they want you to justify that they should get a divorce, yeah. which I imagine in a secular setting, that's probably a common counsel. Hey, sure. you guys, we've done this. We've met for like this four, isn't four working. months now. This isn't working. You should just end it and yeah, be done the, with it. The approach there is a lot of times you, um, you know, you shift based on what their goals are and you help them walk through separating. That's what the world does. Wow. Yeah. So seven years, they show up, yeah. they, they're self-destructing. Yeah. Jeez. And then I see people around the, you know, 20 to 25 year mark, which is, you know, people get married. Midlife crisis. They era. have kids. And then it's this moment where their kids leave the house and they're left. They're looking at this person that they have neglected for the last 20 years and they don't know what to do. You know, they, anytime, you know, something would come up, a conflict or whatever, they just, you know, redirected their focus towards their kids. And now that they're, you know, the empty nester, right? Now that they don't have their kids there, they, they're they like, what are we going to do for the next everything four is, years? E everything is out in the open. There's nothing to hide behind. You can't, right. there's no, I've got to go to soccer practice right. anymore. You know, No distraction. It's just you and that other person. And, and it's and terrifying. Oh, yeah, I forgot that there's all these things about them that I don't like that yep. I've been ignoring. Yep. Wow, man, yeah. that's So that's I get terrible. a call from the wife in May you know, with their last kid graduating from high school. And they're like, I think we need marriage counseling because they're starting to think mm -hmm. about what summer and September is going to look like, you know? And it's, yeah. I mean, it almost every May I get, I get calls about couples who are needing counseling. And that's, that's a lot of times. And is it usually the, the woman? Oh yeah. That, that calls. Oh yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> Which is a, that's a, that's an issue, right? You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, she's yeah. leading. She's yeah. the one who sees the problem. She's the one that's desperate. She's the one that's sensitive emotionally to what's going on. Mm -hmm. And homeboy is back there scratching his belly, it's watching, fun. watching the baseball game. We'll be fine. We'll figure it out. Yep. I just need one more beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, so, that's so it. Let's talk about the issues specifically. And I think this is going to be interesting for people to hear about, but let's, I want to ask you and I want to hear about what are some of the specific things that people are talking about when they show up and they come into your office? What are the things that are presenting uh, yeah. the strongest? Well, you, you know, you, you probably can name off a lot of these things, you know, um, communication is uh, obviously a huge problem. Um, intimacy issues, financial distress, a lot of parenting disagreements and there's bigger issues like uh, an affair or some, some sort of, you know, betrayal of, you know, but the reason why couples um, get themselves into these issues is because they're not operating in the light of spiritual, the spiritual reality that they are one. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not operating under the reality that they're one. And this oneness in marriages is, is based on the very first interpersonal relationship that we see uh, in the Bible, right? Yeah. So we see in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve, uh, we talk about leaving and cleaving. It says in uh, Genesis 2.24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So this leaving is uh, this shift in their attention or their core loyalty from their family of origin to their spouse. And 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is where, kind of like you mentioned in in the book, where God forms a new ministry, a new vision, a new life together. And this isn't to say that we just disregard our family, but our, our, the important, um, human devotion goes to that. Yeah. The priority gets shifted. Yeah, absolutely. So there's that leaving, but then that leads to cleaving. There's this, uh, we become one where we are bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh. And this is why, um, divorce and, uh, any type of divisiveness or division in the relationship is so destructive mm-hmm. because on a spiritual level, we are one. So what's cool is what comes with this oneness is that in part, we get to live out what we were intended to. So it says in uh, Genesis 2.25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And so, man, that's one of the coolest things when you first get married is it's just you get to be naked. Yeah. Right? That, yeah. Good point. It's cool, right? It but, is cool. But there's something greater there. It's yes. the issue of not being ashamed. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you get to be naked. And the reason why you get to do it is because you're not feeling that shame for it. And, you know, a lot of times, um, the, you know, the world, we just get to be naked and we have to find something to do with our shame. Like yeah. you still feel it, but you're having to find. You suppress the, the way, way you feel, you, right. you distract yourself from it. And then here comes the the defense mechanisms. Right. Right. You, you got to, I mean, Adam and Eve covered up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so it isn't, it isn't just the, you know, the physical, but it, um, you know, you get to be in a relationship with someone who sees you, like you were talking about earlier. It's like, they see all of you, your flaws, your faults, yet with no judgment, you Mm -hmm. know, they accept you fully for who you are. And, um, this is an awesome thing that we get to have in, in our relationships. Um, but if we aren't, you know, spiritually minded, you know, and, and even with the pillars of oneness, like a leaving and cleaving, we can still apply this in a self-centered way. So, you know, I finally get to leave my family. I get to, I get to have somebody in my life. That's going to be all about me. They're going to, you know, complete me. Mm -hmm. Um, we put this responsibility on this person to meet and to fulfill all of our needs mentally, emotionally. And to fix things that weren't right before. Right. Like now, like things weren't right. My relationships weren't right. Um, You know, I wasn't finding any pleasure. You know, I had no one to pay attention to me. And now that I'm in this relationship. They're going to do that. They're going to do that for me. They're going to fulfill all of those wants. And that's a ton of pressure to put on a human. You know, it's just, it doesn't work. And so, um, essentially our marital relationships become like our own personal little Messiah and, and that mm-hmm. from that position. And, um, it just is another ineffective coping strategy. It's like a new security blanket before I was doing something else and now I'm doing this. A good example of this, uh, is, uh, you know, physical intimacy, sex. We see the world has turned sex into this instant gratification mm-hmm. and we objectify other peoples to gratify us. And, And yet, uh, you know, in Christian marriages, we can do this as well. You know, we can be in a physical relationship with our spouse in a way that um, isn't pleasing to God. And what I mean by that is that um, instead of uh, us seeing this this person as a manifestation of the intimacy that God created, we end up just using them as a means to an end uh, for ourselves. So God did design, you know, marriage. He says the marriage bed is undefiled. And it is, right? But I'm talking about in terms of our heart issue. Right, like, right. Um, it needs to be about intimacy. And that can look like all of those other things. Now, one of the ways we talk about it in, in, the, in starting right is that, is that intellectual, emotional, and spiritual intimacy should culminate in physical intimacy. Yes, it's a reward. It's, yes. an, it's, a, it's the, a benefit of having all these other forms of intimacy right. in your relationship versus the reverse of that, right? right? Like I think a lot of times people are looking for a sexually intimate relationship right. with someone and then hoping beyond hope that, you know, if we have sex a bunch, we'll also be friends. Right. And it doesn't really work that right. way. There has to be a pursuit. I thought about like the the um, love languages, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And one of my, the main things that I, you know, the trouble that I have with the love languages is um, that it's used as uh, artillery in the counseling setting yeah. where her husband's like, well, you know, my love language is touch. And so right. she just doesn't get that, you yeah. know? And it's like, well, God designed you 
for all of the love languages to be your love language, Mm -hmm. you know, and if you're healthy minded. Yeah. (laughs) And if you are, you know, pursuing your wife with all of those love languages, then naturally touch is going to happen. Right. You know? And so we have to, um, you know, be engaging mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And then when we do that, those are those forms of intimacy, man, you know, like physical intimacy is the only natural step. Yeah. It's absolute freedom. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the love languages and I love putting the love languages on blast. Yeah. The one that I hate the most. Yeah. There is no biblical space for is the one gifts. Gift giving. Gift giving. Yeah. I, you know what my love language is? <laughs> is you giving me stuff. You buying me things. Spending my, I, I, I'm a material, God has made me to be materialistic. Yes. And my love language is it. you pouring out, you know, financial yeah. blessing into my life. Yeah. What yeah. is that? That's nonsense. Yeah. And that's the worst one to admit too. It's like, yeah. It, like who's, nobody wants to say that. It's like, well, yeah. And fortunately this is just, just who God made like, me to be. Oh gosh. Yeah. Get out of here with that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, no, God, it's messed up. A lot of that is not rooted in biblical concepts. Right. They're, 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 it's pop psychology. Yep. Um, and we believe the Bible. Yeah. And the and, Bible says that the intimacy looks like friendship as well as, right. as physical. Absolutely. Things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when we, when we think about when someone comes into, you know, the counseling room and they have all kinds of presenting issues, it can feel overwhelming. Um, but, but like you have to sift through all of it. Like right. oh, each one of these things is so massive and, and, and the each thing, each behavior, each right. distressor needs to be addressed one at a time, like this laundry list. Mm-hmm. But it's but not really always that way, is it? It isn't. I think uh, I picture in my mind like a tree. And so you think about all the leaves on a tree. Mm-hmm. It's like incredibly overwhelming. Like, you know, but if you follow those leaves down to, you know, the branches and into the trunk, it goes down to this root ball, you know, and that's mm-hmm. the truth for us as humans as well. Like someone comes into a counseling set, you know, scenario, they have, you know, hundreds of problems, but there's actually just one root issue, you mm-hmm. know, and it's, uh, when our heart is not postured the way that God's called us to. Mm, yeah, that's good. So what really causes marital issues then? Like, so what are these root issues that, that, yeah, yeah. that what is the trunk and the root that you mm-hmm. just referred to? Explain that to us. So the, the answer to this is in Genesis. You know, we, uh, we get to see uh, the first marital conflict and the first marital uh, counseling session, you know, mm-hmm. so you have Genesis three, we know like the serpent comes into the garden, um, and we find Adam and Eve partaking, and then they are aware that they're naked. And then in verse nine, it says, and the Lord God called unto Adam and he said unto them, where art thou? So here begins, you know, the counseling session. And mm-hmm. this is also a really good counseling tool. Just side note, you know, um, a lot of times we ask people questions that we might that as a counselor, we already know the answer to, mm-hmm. right? God obviously knew. They're leading questions. Yeah, it's like Adam's right there, you know? It's yeah. like, but he asked him that because he was really asking him, you know, you know what's happened in your heart. Yeah, right? you, you need to discover for yourself, yes. where are you and why is it that you're hiding? What yes. is it that's broken in our relationship? It's not like God didn't know where Adam was. Right. It's a question for the benefit of Adam himself. Absolutely. Yeah. And then we see him reveal uh, the key, I would say the the main issue in relationships is this uh, shame and blame. So Adam starts with being ashamed. So in uh, Genesis 3.10, he says, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So being afraid and hiding is shame, you mm-hmm. know, and, and that's exactly what we do as well, whether it be hiding behind some persona or, you know, some addiction or preoccupation or even something that seems good, like being a good mom or dad, like we were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. or a good Bible study leader, but we find something to hide behind, to hide the things that we don't know to do with. And mm-hmm. then that leads into the second part where Adam then blames. So we know that, you know, God's asking him, like, how'd you know you were naked? And he said, well, the woman that you gave me, uh, it's her fault. And so he's blaming both God yeah. and her. And and we do that as well. You mm-hmm. know, we end up blaming um, others for what we're doing and we end up spending more time, especially at the beginning of a counseling setting, we're busy trying to get the speck out of our, our spouse's eye, you know, the little sin that maybe they've done and we're yeah. ignoring this beam yeah, in our own little, eye. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's so true. And so it's always looking like, Hey, 
uh, she, she always says this or mm-hmm. he always does this. And, and so it's tit for tat and you got to cut through that yes. because all of the blame shifting right. doesn't get you anywhere. There's, right. there's no answer and there's no solution in that. You've got all this blame shifting going on. You've got all this, these, these people pointing the finger at one another and, and pointing at very specific, you know, they're, they're plucking each individual leaf off the tree mm-hmm. and you've got to get them to that root issue. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? Like, mm-hmm. how do you get them to a place where they can see for themselves that, that there's an answer and exists somewhere here at the root? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, like when people coming in, they are not um, intimate allies, you know, they're not like with each other. They are angry, they're hurt, they're blaming and, you know, it can get really nasty. I I think um, the goal of the biblical counselor is that we need to be equipped by God and his word so that we can equip them so that they can then equip each other. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we're essentially teaching them um, how to uh, apply the, the word of God to their life. So in, in a biblical counseling individual session, the goal is to teach them how to self-counsel. And so that's the same, uh, you know, as in marriage counseling, we're teaching them how to biblically counsel each other. Yeah, truths that they can pl- apply day to day, instance by instance. Right. So yeah. I, I, it kind of looks like a, a coaching relationship in a way where we're hoping to help them shift from this I focus to we. I, I think about... Um, I was watching the NBA finals uh, mm-hmm. this last week and um, you see these guys and they have this, this, the craziest abilities, you know, it's like when you really think about what these guys are able to do, like these fundamentals that just become muscle memory. Yeah. It's innate. It's wild, you yeah. know, just like being able to shoot a shot from 40 feet out like that. And the, well, the reason for it is because they spent countless hours in a practice facility shooting that shot and they have a coach right there. And it's like, Hey, your elbows out. Hey, you're jumping this way. Hey, you mm-hmm. know, so that they know exactly what they're doing so that when they're in the game, um, you know, they can it's shoot second nature. Yes. Right. And that's, that's essentially what, you know, we, we want to implement in couples counseling. We want to, for the, the counseling office to be a practice facility where couples can actually practice and we can sit there and watch and go, this isn't working. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, I think that would be the the main you know goal in, in in terms of being able to try to help them in a counseling session. So you are you know you're used to doing this in your professional practice in a professional setting. Mm-hmm. You've done of it some some of it here through a local church setting as mm-hmm. well. Um, but we're talking to you know primarily students in the Bible Institute. That's who mm-hmm. this show is pointed at but also just Christians and believers who hold to the same approach to God's word mm-hmm. that we do. And, and they want to be effective ministers in their own church. They too want to be biblical counselors at varying levels, maybe right. really intentionally, or maybe just being good, a good Bible study leader. Mm-hmm. Right. But we're, we're aiming this at people who practice biblical counseling within the context right. of their own local churches and ministries. And so with that in mind, I, I want to ask this question, what, what is it that people in these local church settings need to consider when they're engaging people who are hurting in marriages and they sit down and they're trying to lead people in these conversations that, that you do professionally, mm-hmm. they want to be able to lead people in the same way. How do they go about doing right. that? What does it look like? Practically, I think uh, the, the main thing that, that we need to work on is getting out of the way so couples can couple. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times you might need to... Uh, you know, have an off meeting with, you know, the wife or the husband, or even in the counseling, you know, you know, couples counseling setting, you, you, maybe you're counseling one uh, spouse over the other, but, but for the most part, counseling is not uh, individual counseling with an audience. It's, it's not marriage counseling can't be a spectator sport, right? Mm -hmm. We need them to be engaging with one another. And, and man, the the reality is uh, marriage counseling is weird. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's mean, weird why? because it's it's generally one person the counselor yeah and two people and you are it's like a little bit of monkey in the middle you're, you're imposing make, yeah you're imposing on their relationship in a way that is really foreign to them you know it's awkward they're they're afraid they're ashamed you're someone they don't know very well right. And uh, they're ashamed to confess some of the things that have been going on. And, yeah. you're, and you're trying to make sense of it because they are blaming each other. Right. You've got to decipher what's true and what's not. Right. Right. Seems, and all that seems difficult. It is. And, um, you know, 
when you're when you're working with a couple, the the relationship is your primary focus. So when you're working with individuals, you're working, you know, you're you're teaming with an individual, but now you're teaming with the relationship. And if you're doing it right, it's really uncomfortable, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're you're putting their feet to the fire. You're not. Uh, you have to challenge them both, you know, and 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 share hard hard truths after you've built the rapport to do so. But it's going to feel uncomfortable, and it's it. I think it can especially feel uncomfortable for. Uh, you know, biblical counselors in, in the church setting, because oftentimes we're used to a certain type of communication where, you know, when we come to church, um, we have a speaker and we have an audience and mm-hmm. counseling, it, it isn't that, it's not preaching, you mm-hmm. know? And so we're used to that setting. And when we get uncomfortable, we we move to what is more comfortable, which typically we're more comfortable with a monologue rather than yeah. what's needful is t- for it to be a dialogue. And I think the reason we do that is because it's super messy and scary. You know, when people have been hurting each other for a long time, um, man, it can get nasty. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is we feel more comfortable with just teaching them what they they need to hear and then telling them, you know, to go and do that. Yeah. Um, Here's the assignment. Right. Peace out. And the problem with that approach is that it's difficult to instruct those who impose themselves when we don't see how they're opposing themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to get them to turn towards one another. I mean, I, you know, I, I will have to instruct people, you know, Hey, can you turn towards one another? And then they'll slowly start talking to me again in the world of COVID, you know, I'll just turn my camera off. A lot of times I can hear them so that they, it forces them to talk to one another. But Mm. What happens is they end up uh, telling you exactly what you need to work on, you know, and so a lot of times people even want to talk about what happened. And, and that's fine. We need to talk about things in order to gain context, but we need to talk about what's happening in your relationship right now. So yeah. bringing them back into the moment yeah, right that's then. That's really important. So getting them off the baggage. Yes. Right. You're here because you, from this moment moving forward, you mm-hmm. want things to be right. So in some regard, even though we've, we've looked back at the past and seen w- ways in which we've historically hurt each other to create some context, um, that's not where we focus our attention. We're focusing our attention on what's happening in mm-hmm. this moment because we want the future to be bright. Right. And if you can't get them to act the way that they, you know, are acting outside of there. A lot of times people show up and they're, they're on their best behavior, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's unfortunate because you can instruct them and then they'll go off and keep doing the thing they need to do. And, and so we have to break that, um, you know, like that's kind of what they're expecting coming in. It's going to be like that, that you just, they just tell you what's happening and then you tell them what to do and they go and do it. Mm-hmm. What uh, comes to mind when I was a, a, a kid, my family went to Hawaii and I was excited because you know, when I think of Hawaii, I just think of people surfing. So my plan was, I'm going to learn how to surf when I'm in Hawaii. So uh, the the lifeguards had a clinic and it was ran by some teenage kids. And so they had everybody who paid them, you know, lay on a surfboard on the beach. And one of the guys laid on the surfboard and he's like, okay, you lay on the board. And then he started paddling in the sand. And then he jumped up into the surfing position. He's like, all right, everybody knows how to surf and just sent everybody out in the water. And like, dude, I almost died. You know, like (laughs) it was so, I was a kid, but I didn't know how to surf, you know? And I, I got pummeled and chafed in ways that I didn't know was possible. (laughs) Right. But that's what we often do to couples is that we come in, you know, and we tell them, you know, what they should do. And then we send them out and they get pummeled. Right. You know, um, I, this is, this is what happened. There was a, a local out there and he saw me and he came alongside me and he started showing me how to surf. And he taught me that, you know, when you're surfing and I, this is the only time I've ever done it, but mm-hmm. so this might be wrong, but what he said was there's like a sweet spot, you know, on the wave when you're trying to catch the wave where you feel the wave pulling you up and you also f- feel gravity pushing you down and you gotta ha- you gotta find that spot in order to know how to surf. And man, there is a sweet spot uh, for effective marriage counseling Mm -hmm. and it's to help the couple see each other's pain, like how they're hurting each other, and then to teach them how to tend to that pain biblically through repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So if you can help them find that sweet spot and then you show them in this place, right? 
then they can go out and do that, mm. which is the whole goal. Yeah. And that sweet spot being an area of tenderness or difficulty or vulnerability. Mm -hmm. When you, when you find that moment in the dialogue, using that as a platform to coach them, like, oh, we found a spot here that needs to be addressed. They're both in it. They both see it. They're both are open. Now let's, let's take this and ride. Let's use this as the coaching moment to get a little bit of victory. Yes. So there's this, you know, there's that cycle that plays out and we talk about that in the intro class and different, you know, classes, but there's this cycle that plays out in relationships that we, uh, it happens between us, but we end up looking past it and we see each other as our enemy. Mm-hmm. And the reality is that, you know, the the main thing that we're teaching people in biblical counseling is that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We have a real enemy. And so we bring this cycle out, this, the cycle that's being perpetuated by the accuser of the brethren. I mean, man, Satan hates marriage because of the picture that it displays. He hates it. And so if he can get us, you know, hating each other, then we've completely become debilitated and and sidelined from being about, you know, you know, kingdom work. Right. So if we can get couples to see that cycle and then they can team together against that thing that's happening between the two of them, man, like when you were in, this is, it's always incredible when you're sitting with a couple and they, they actually start to see how much pain they're causing each other. You mm-hmm. know, the, the guardedness starts coming down and they can see the, the wounds that they're causing each other and their heart starts to break. You know, it's like, oh gosh, mm. I, you know, and they repent and then they, and, and, you know, and the other spouse sees this person broken because of the hurt they've caused them. It's like, you get to step back and watch God work mm-hmm. in a way because, you know, that's the beginning of healing in the relationship. Yeah. And, and then God is free to move and, and teach them and for them to grow and to continue to take that and apply it to different parts of their life. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And, and there's not really, you know, there are so many ways in which we disciple in the context of our local church. Mm-hmm. This is one way. Yeah. People don't know how to have good relationships the same way they don't know how to read their Bible, the same way they don't know how to, to, to function in relationship mm-hmm. at church, the same way they don't know how to be good you know, employees Mm -hmm. at their job, whatever it is, people don't know how. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity to help someone come along and grow and mature um, in their relationship with the Lord and the relationship with with someone else. And it's worthy of our attention and it's Mm -hmm. worthy as ministers and churches, growing leaders in our churches to figure out uh, how to do this, both in terms of our theology, Mm -hmm. but then also in terms of being a practitioner. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, you're the, you're the guy to help us with that. So thank you for this, for the show and for hanging out with us and, and, and kind of giving us a primer on, on some of the concepts that are critical for, for biblical marriages. Man, grateful to be here. And just, again, I say this every time, but so grateful for this ministry and, uh, for LFBI, like, Mm -hmm. man, I, I get the privilege to teach at LFBI and I, I feel like God just like um, uses LFBI so much in my life to teach there, but also the classes I'm taking there. It's like so grateful for that resource and um, grateful for you for doing this and telling people about it. Yeah. Love you, dude. Thank Love you. Love you too. And so I'm going to use this as an opportunity to, to also just plug the the resources that we do have available. John mentioned that he and I are working on a book. Hopefully you'll see that in the, uh, the fall. That'll be more of an academic book, but it'll lay out the entire theological, philosophical approach that we take in terms of biblical counseling here at LFBI. And and that'll be available hopefully in the fall. But this is the book that we're using a lot in terms of premarital. A lot of the churches in the Living Faith Fellowship are using Starting Right. Um, I had the privilege of contributing a little bit to Starting Right, uh, but it is a material, a curriculum for premarital, but it can also be used as a guide for counseling uh, marriage issues that arise in your church. And so uh, it is a, it's a good resource and, and we want to encourage you to check it out. It's also very inexpensive. I can't remember what it costs. I think it's five bucks on Amazon. If you're, if you're looking for something like this in terms of learning how to, uh, to counsel uh, marriages, but uh, we're grateful for you. And we, we want to pray that, that, that God would use conversations like this to encourage you and strengthen you. And we want to invite you into LFBI. That's always one of our goals is to get you to consider whether or not there are classes that you need to take. 
uh, introduction to biblical counseling would be a great place to start if you're interested in helping people with their problems. If you know that you're prone to uh, investing in uh, relationships and and emotions and 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 issues with people that are really painful, if you're a natural empathizer, if you if you love to sit with people in their problems and help them uh, get a, a grasp on what God's word says for their life, if you're prone to that, man, uh, introduction to biblical counseling is a great place to start. If you want to hone that, that gifting and make sure that you have a grasp on the theological issues that pop up in, so many times in counseling issues. Beyond that, we offer other classes, Biblical Counseling Lab 1, 2, and 3 uh, that are being offered regularly. Uh, teaching you how to practice counseling, the methodology and the strategies behind counseling. How do you how do you effectively use God's word uh, when you're meeting with someone? Uh, what are the things that you're saying? How is it you're posturing yourself? Um, how is it that you're speaking and listening? All these are really important skills that we want uh, to invite you to come learn about. And and so uh, please do that. Please do that. We love you and we're grateful for you. We're, we're thankful for any time that we get to spend with you on the postscript and we can't wait to be with you again next week for another episode. God bless. Thanks for listening to the postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, Please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.